commencé ses partenaires Skyti. Vous souhaite une agréable soirée à Cotonou. That's a go meet up with Neil from Wadimba Travel. This is Neil and that's Edwin. Hey, Hello. what's up my guy? How you doing? <laughs> Come on, Jesse. Let's hurry up and cross. Let's see it starts raining again. Look at this, every single page is filled out. I don't think it's ever happened before in a, tri in a trip. <laughs> My experience in Benin made me feel connected to a storied history that is dispersed around the world. A story of survival, of ingenuity, of courage, and bravery. Is it moving? Though one of Africa's smallest countries, Benin is far from a monolith. Each experience in town had its own personality, language, food, history, people, and the environment reflected that diversity. Sandy beaches, lush tropical forests, dry arid land, concrete jungles in the middle of commerce. The only commonality, the eagerness of the Beninese people to welcome you. This is the land of Webadja. Mm -hmm. so, the land of Webadja. Yes. And they consider you descendant of Webadja too. Mm -hmm. you know? And our ancestors are blessing you. About to embark on our journey here in Gambia. Hey, bonjour. Hey. <laughs> hey, so right here is the fish market. In the morning time, they'll go and they'll fish, then they'll bring the fish back over here. This is a port. Let me show you where the port is. This is the port right over there. And they'll come and they'll bring the fish and they'll sell it here. The men are out there fishing and the women will come and they'll sell the fish. 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., you can barter. You don't have to pay with actual money in cash, right? You can barter, you know, with different goods. But from 7 a.m. to uh, 11 p.m., you got to pay that money. <laughs> so it just goes to show that the early bird does catch the fish. Or is it the worm? You know what I'm talking about. This is our guy for the day, Edmund. Yeah, Edmund. I'm going to show you my, my hometown. Oh, really? Okay, Region. so you were, you were born in Gambia then? I'm born in Gambia, yeah. All right, well, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Good morning. So the boat is VIP boat. Oh, we got the VIP? Yeah, also, it's covered. When oh, you can rain, okay. there is snow, <laughs> we are all protected. Hey, okay. Yeah. Get the, the VIP. Galvie, a modern day water world in the Venice of Africa. Roughly 30,000 people living in the middle of the lake for 400 years and Cali. In the 1700s, the Tofanu people, Tofanu meaning people of the water, fled the fallen warriors who were capturing Africans and selling them to slave traders. So they established a village in the middle of a lake to escape. It was called Gambier, meaning we survived. From above, it looks like a mosaic of houses, but they're not. There are also restaurants, markets, churches, hospitals, businesses, you name it. The people primarily live by fishing, so households typically have three boats. One for the waterman, the man, one for the wife, and one for the kids. Houses last about 20 years, and the planks supporting the houses are changed individually every five years. It takes about 10 minutes to arrive to the center of Gambia, so Edmund took that time to educate me about bombas, the traditional clothing they wear in Benin, sometimes colorful, sometimes not, okay, yeah. and how men and women can ask each other to marry one another. If men say no, that is the end of conversation. Can a woman ask you to marry her? Of course. Okay. But if the women say no, that's the beginning of conversation. So get this. 
If a man says no, that's the end of it. If a woman says no, well, he can keep on trying. And as we got closer to the center of the city, we could hear drum beat. So, as we get closer... Yeah, yeah the um, first. Today we have to send that. Oh, they're singing. Yeah. And the way they bomb us. Every pictures. It was a welcome like none wow. other. I was nervous when they climbed in our boat because I knew they were going to ask me to dance. I didn't want to disappoint folks back home and lose my black card or the ancestors who I'm sure were watching. Now my rowing skills, I was with it, solid. That's how you welcome someone to your town. I'm trying to show up the family barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> that up, man. <laughs> That's a welcome. That's a welcome. Wow, beautiful. Okay, so you are welcome to Residence Saudi. Welcome. Welcome home, man. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Compliments to the chef, and also thank you for having us in our house. What a walk. <laughs> Chief of protocol, so you will tell us how to greet the king, how to meet the king and how to greet the king. As part of the instructions we have, uh -huh. we cannot record until we get to the king and we will have to ask permission. Okay. So we have to be off until you know we get clearance effectively. Okay, so you want to cut it now? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What I thought I knew about slavery was a mere fraction compared to what I learned walking the same path as enslaved Africans, my ancestors. You can see that the dirt is really, really red. And I'm guessing too that this was also made to construct the fence or the wall around the kingdom here, just how um, expansive it is. The tour started in Abomi, where it all began a powerful kingdom that derived much of its wealth by trading prisoners of war, soon to be slaves, with European merchants. Our local guide and historian, Ube, took us to the first palace that is still preserved today. All of the palaces were made with mud, mud bricks, and adorned with carvings depicting the culture and recounts of victorious battles. This palace is deemed a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so it is protected not quite yet open to the public. But later we tried anyway to fly a drone to see if we could find it from above. Suffice to say, we weren't successful. One of the most frustrating things is being this close to this history and not being able to go inside of the kingdom right now because it's being renovated. That's about as close as I'll get right now, at least on this visit. One of the highlights was meeting with the descendant of King Bahazin, who was quite active in the slave trade. I didn't know how I was going to feel meeting a descendant of a king that sold my ancestors into slavery. Indignant? Emotional? Indifferent? To enter the kingdom, you must be barefoot, then bow your forehead to the ground. Then you present the king with a gift. 
we gave whiskey. I was unprepared when his ajaho, the person who speaks for the king, asked what I would like to ask the king. I said my first thought. What does it mean for the king to meet some of the descendants? Qu'est-ce que ça ça fait au roi de rencontrer certains des descendants? Fasten, Jadikon touch Nshamon, fils du roi. He said, all of us are sons of the king, so how should a father meeting his sons be extremely happy? And they consider you descendant of Kulbaja too. Mm. And our ancestors are blessing you. Pray that you will, uh, everything will be well here. You have a nice journey back, and that from time to time you need to come back. And, yeah, so here. You want any initial impressions here while we're still in here? Um, yeah, I guess we, I guess we can film it. I don't know, I just, um, <laughs> So one thing that he said was just that was um, really, I don't know why, it just made me emotional, but he said that the ancestors bless you. And, you know, that was just really nice to, um, to feel and see that love was there. That was still, you know, because um, oftentimes we don't feel as connected to history, or at least I haven't. Um, and so to see that that was, um, that was the first thing he said, and then to say how should a father feel when his son returns. I don't know, just, um, just really got me. That's all I got right now. I'll be honest, in that moment, as emotional as I was, I was confused. Why would the king who sold my ancestors into slavery be blessing me now? We're in the middle of downtown Wida right now, as you can see, it's just in the morning time, so people are still kind of getting up. The first part of the tour, we learned about the kingdoms and how they got involved with the slave trade. And now we're actually going to walk the similar path Africans were walking once they were captured. Right now, I'm in the middle of Cha Cha Square, but let me tell you the reason why this is so significant. This tree right here is over 400 years old. And just to imagine like where we are standing right now, this would be the auction block or where they would bring the slaves up, bring all the captured Africans up and they would sell them to the various Europeans. And sitting right there in the middle of this square is the slave master who is orchestrating it all. Francisco Felix de Souza and he is of, of Brazilian descent. And it's called cha-cha because cha-cha means very hurried and quick because D'Souza was really rapid about his business and could just move people in and out. And so they called this cha-cha square. Still to this day, his descendants can look out the window and see this part of history that has affected so, so many around the world. It's just, a, it's wild and incredible at the same time. Walking in history can be overwhelming, especially a history marred in so much sadness. But I needed to know, I wanted to be here. The place where it all began, the jail where they kept the enslaved, the 120 kilometer walk to the beach. I was experiencing the journey in real time. So if you can just imagine walking kilometers, walking about one and a half kilometers, uh, in the hot sun, shackled, and you're not able to speak because they don't want you to be able to communicate with anyone. Remember, you are captured and you're with the Europeans and they don't know what language you're speaking, so it's all done in silence. You're making your way all the way down from Chacha Square to right here, down the slave route. They would stop here at the House of Zumai. Now, this is the House of Zumai. Of course, you can see right now that it's been destroyed. But this was a training ground. Zamai means no lights. So there was only one door to go in and no lights. And so they were kept there for about two weeks. They weren't allowed to speak to each other because they didn't want them to revolt. And this is what they did. It was training. So they taught them how to sit like this because this was going to mimic the way that it was on the ship. This is where they would bring the sick 
and the dead that did not survive the, the House of Zumai, and they would just dump them here in this grave. But in 1992, they discovered bones of a lot of the enslaved, and so about 12 meters wide and about 12 meters deep. Remember, a lot of them did not want to go. They were scared. They had no idea what was going on. They couldn't understand the language, and they were just told to be quiet. And so you've got to just understand the mentality. They're like, you know, it would be better to die in my homeland that I know than die in a foreign place. Those that survived the house of Humai, they would come here. This is the tree of return. The idea was that they would march around this three times before getting onto the ship. Now, tree of return, no one who was enslaved has ever returned. So what does that mean? It means that their spirit, even when their spirit dies over there, it will come back here to the homeland where it all began. And our ancestors are blessing you. So right here, I'm basically at the monument of the door of no return. As you can right see right here in the backdrop, that's the ocean. It's a door of no return because you could either go this way but you can never go back. And so as a way to memorialize what happened, they built this door. And at the top, you see the slaves and the ship. And on the other side of that, you see this exact same image, but there is a tree of return in the middle because of course, no one that was ever enslaved has ever returned, um, but their spirit has. And um, so I uh, have their descendants. That moment, in front of the water, I thought about the captured that jumped overboard and never made it to the ship or final destination. Better to die in one's homeland than in a foreign place. So we just got to Stepwa, and basically it's where the Ono River meets the Atlantic Ocean and they just converge. Stepwa, the mouth of the king, it actually changes depending on the currents. This is just a big pile of sand. And so a few years ago, the mouth of the king was back there. It really just depends on the way the tide is going at that time. had breakfast and now we're about to go tour the city on a motorcycle tour um, so one of the ways the main way that people get around here is on motorcycles all right so yes, this is this is Yannick director okay. of operations of Il Motors company uh -huh. they're effectively re revolutionizing what's happening here in Benin from an electric mobility perspective those two models are electric right so in a country that's you know effectively full of motorcycles it's good to have the ability to transition to cleaner energy yeah and so that's what those guys are doing and so today you get to visit a town with one of those. Sweet, right. let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cotonou, population 700,000 and growing. A budding economy eager to compete in tourism on the global stage. This is not the Africa many believe the continent to be. This is enterprise. This is entrepreneurship. This is investment. Downtown is anchored by scaffolding, cranes, and domestic and international engineers that bring innovation. And while the streets may buzz with motorcycles, this Benin envisions an energy-efficient economy, so they welcome efforts to popularize electric vehicles. We are at the wall, we are the graffiti wall of Cotonou, uh, which is the longest graffiti wall in West Africa and soon the longest graffiti wall in the world. <laughs> the here. Still gotta get the shot. Yeah. Part of the festival, a graffiti festival that we have been doing in Benin since eight years now. 
Wow. So we, the last year it was the eighth edition of the festival, uh -huh. and we invite we invited many artists from over the world. The graffiti wall, more of an outdoor art museum, spans 940 meters, making it the longest graffiti wall in Africa. It is host to artists from around the world who proudly display aspects of their culture and sometimes Beninese cultures. It represents the Benin that endeavors to become the next great tourist destination. All right, y'all, so I thought that the MLK statue in the monument was big, but check out this Queen Hangbei monument right here. This represents Queen Tasi Hangbei, which was, she was the only woman to rule the kingdom of Dahomey in the 18th century. Now she is touted because of her bravery and her military expertise, but she led an all women regime to defend the kingdom. And if you've ever seen that movie, The Woman King, of course there are a little bit of discrepancies here and there, but it's based off of the story. More importantly, you see how grand this is. And it's basically a testament too to the way that Beninese women are seen in society. That they're not just behind the curtains, they're not in the kitchen, they're not doing the laundry, but they're the leaders. They're the leaders in commerce, they're the leaders in military. It, and, and it's a respect thing. And so to be able to tell this story, and concretize it with this monument. It's a huge tourist attraction. Just think about that. Of all the things in the world that they could have actually put up here as a tourist attraction, they chose Queen Hangbei. This is Chachanga. This is basically the way that they grill it to me. That's good. Southern barbecue. It's like being at a family reunion. Everyone had to walk. Jesse, how is it? How is it? Good. It's good. That's, That's good. really good. Hey, I'm telling you, Jeff. That's real good. You know that is only love we can share. And that is Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from <laughs> Africa. Yeah, this is oh, that's I it. know what is that. Oh, uh home. -huh. Yo. Respect. It's respect. Please. Juicy and savory. But this sauce right here, I'm not even sure what this is. It's like a powder. Try to touch it, okay? Try to touch it. Try to touch the fish? Oh, it's a catfish. Let me see you do it. Yeah, I'll see. Oh, he can't be caught. Oh, okay, here, here, here. <laughs> Why did you tell me that? Why did you tell me that? Richard! You, I feel, oh no. That's an electric fish. Oh my God. Sorry. Why did you tell me that? Because I want, I don't to, make, I don't... I want to make surprise for you. Yeah. Yeah, a big surprise. Yeah. Close the door. Hell no, you. Hell no, you ain't riding in the car. Close the door. Take that back. Uh -uh. This is the first of the rainy season we've ever experienced. So it's, now it's raining. Lancer is a French name, but his real name is Benasul. So we're about to check out the Black River, which I've heard a lot about. It's a sacred, right? It's yeah. Sacred. Black so River. all the area of the Black River is a sacred area, but open sacred area. The Black River of Ajada. Mysterious, dramatic, yet peaceful, and actually black. Flanked and nearly shrouded by a lush tropical forest, we slowly made our way down the river with only a canoe and a long stick. It's just you and nature. I noticed the silence. We barely spoke. We were captivated by the river's beauty and peace. The trees contain the medicine and the river is filled with fish and reincarnated ancestors. As you can see, it's just so lush, but all these plants are actually pretty purposeful. In fact, the palm trees is, is used for the roof, is, is used for drinks, and one of them is called the elephant ears. That's a one right there. But all of these, plants are used for medicinal purposes. So malaria, typhoid fever, it even helps women to get pregnant. Just imagine living literally off of nature. Nature is medicine. It just underscores that. Notice this piece of string hanging from the stick in the middle of the river and he says it's a trap. He's gonna take us around so we can look at it. You can put on it a fish meat, fish meat, goat meat, or uh, any kind of meat, uh -huh. and uh, then after you finish to put the uh, meat on it, you let the hookah in the river. 
But this technique, you must wait for uh, maybe uh, 7 p.m. This mm. is the ancestral ah. technique. They were very clear. Certain customs must be observed, or one suffers the consequences that could even be fatal. I tell you that we have two kinds of sacred area. Okay. Okay. So we have an closed sacred area and an open sacred area. But you must follow the rule. Our ancestor and sal on this area. Now, let me tell you the meaning of a sado. Sado. Sa is Sa. A, 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 a people or a king who okay. created this village. Okay. When you say Ndo in my language, it means it's for me. I have it. Okay. Ndo. Ndo. Ndo is, I have it. Ndo is for me. Ndo. I have it. So this village is for Sa. Sa. Because it's Sa who created this village. So it's for Sa. Sa. Sa is a people or a person who created this village. Who, found it? Who, found, who, who was the founder of this village? Okay. We soon yeah. arrived to the end of the Black River, to Avlanco. We were greeted by women, patiently waiting for a canoe to return back to the mainland to sail Akasa. So this is Akasa. So what they do is they will boil the corn, the maize. When they cook the starch that comes out, it kind of comes out to this jelly-like texture right here. Now they eat this you know, with soup. And what they'll do is they'll wrap this inside of banana leaves. Why banana leaves? Well, banana leaves, as we all know, are they have like medicinal properties. And so, as he's put it, you're eating medicine as well. I'm going to try. This is akasa. And in the local language, they call it kana. 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 Mm -hmm. kana. Yeah. Okay. Kana. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, it wasn't for me. But to be fair, mm. I'm not a huge fan of fermented food. It's, with a soup, it's a very good okay. Yeah, you can taste a little bit of the corn, but it's almost like a sour taste, so it would go really well with the soup. I asked them, well, why is it still hot? When's the last time they cooked it? They insulate it right here. So in order to keep it hot to transport to the market, they put it in these baskets, and the baskets on the outside of it, they, they've created an insulation with that cow manure. So they're going to a Jala market where we just came from. Thank you to choose our, our, our trip. Uh -huh. Thank you to enjoy what we are doing. Yeah. And thank you to support us. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay. My man. I was grateful. Centuries later, the customs are still observed. And this experience was more enriching because of it. This is probably the best thing I've tasted on this show. <laughs> this is so good. And that's how you make the quoi in Grand Popo. <laughs> Peace. Okay. This is centuries old history, a living textbook in modern times. A method so proven, it has resisted the urge of modern technology to farm and harvest salt. This is Jebaji, merely one of several salt island villages that exist around the country. The kitchens where the salt is naturally cooked and cleaned are called Jezanji, and the final product, mineral rich salt, is called Ulaje. So, first you find the shiny part where you see that there could be some crystals. You pack it up right here. You see, you can actually kind of see some of the salt crystals right there. And then, dump it over here and it filters down throughout here it takes about maybe two hours for it to filter through you want to continually test it let's take some of the water here that's being filtered out you'll add the palm nuts to it if the palm nuts are floating like this then you know that the water is salty let this continue to to filter out and then take it in the house to go and cook Ooh. Don't fall. <laughs> this is the salt right here so they're gonna to continue to cook that until it turns white. But the good thing about this is that, again, this is the natural way of salt production. If you see my eyes watering right now, it's because 
they'll burn this wood right up under here. This is all man-made for three to six hours. So there's a lot of smoke in here. And since it's rainy season, they've actually covered up the, the top part. So there's not a lot of ventilation, but they'll burn this for about three to six hours until it turns white. When it turns white, they'll come over here and they'll put it into these large salt bags. I think that the most cool thing about this is not just the preservation, but it's the fact that it's so natural. You're gonna get all of the minerals and nutrients. This is all good for you. This is less about leveraging technology to be more efficient and more about the preservation of a process to create a product so pure that is often undervalued, yet quite necessary in our daily lives and diet. Mineral rich salt. All right, Kev, you ready to hold a snake? I'll be honest with you. I've been, I've been excited about seeing it, but now that I'm here, my anxiety's way up. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it, Jesse. Okay, in here. So they communicate with the python through this divinity. Yes. Only initiated people and the worshippers and priests can go inside. But when you are not initiated, you stay here and just pray. Okay, hurry up. Hurry up with the photo. Okay. All right, is it moving? All right, I'm good. I think I have enough photos. <laughs> oh, hurry up and get them! <laughs> okay, there we go. This one's moving. Where's she going? Uh, Is he staying there? Yeah. Let's get it. He's I think he's, he's. That's Jesse freaking out. Right away. I know. <laughs> You can see behind me, um, I'm here at one of the things that I've been most looking forward to. I think me and Jesse were both looking forward to this. Zang Beto, one part historic, one part celebration, all parts majestic. Historically, Zang Beto, which means watchman of the night, policed the streets to maintain law and order. A giant imposing dancing structure draped in dyed thin hay and adorned with color is empty, believed to be inhabited by spirit. And so what's happening is that they're trying to capture the Zangbeto and, and the Zangbeto is trying to escape. It's really remarkable to see. Oh! Ah. Oh! <laughs> It's part of the Vundun culture in Benin and parts of West Africa that is still observed today. It's as entertaining as it is unifying. The whole village comes to celebrate and watch for hours. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. As part of the celebration, they would offer the spirit of the Zangbeto something for the protection of the village. And I was confused when they offered dry spaghetti and tomato sauce. But the spirit cooked it. Is it cooked pasta? <laughs> it better not be cooked. It's hot? It's hot. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, hot. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. Undoubtedly, this was one of the most beautiful and unique experiences of a lifetime. We later met with the local village chief. And chiefs act like a mayor, but with more power. Yeah, so water is what gets you to feel at peace. Okay. And that's why they do that. So they, they do the same. They help resolve conflict and are the mandatory first stop before escalating an issue to the government. So they keep the pulse of the community. I was mesmerized by the chief. Not only what he said, but also how he seemingly glowed. Imagine melanin so rich it even colors the white of your eyes. You can't look away.
can you give me a little bit of insight into what your role is put here in Hosonkwe? The chef de village is the base to go to foundation to go higher is to become chief of village. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, le plafond, mm -hmm. je parle du président de la République. C'est nous qui l'est. The higher echelon being president of the country. Okay. Davi, me wakbol piano. I was honored. The chief enjoyed our conversation so much, he invited us inside his home. A privilege rarely extended to outsiders. You heard of Sudabi, right? Mm -hmm. Sudabi, the, the, the alcohol, local alcohol. Okay. Mm -hmm. right? No, 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 I have not, but this is the first time. He's going to take the first sip and then we'll ask him to do the same. Okay. C'est pas mal. C'est bien. C'est bien. C'est bien. <laughs> Every single page is filled out. I don't think it's ever happened before in a trip. In a trip. Fish, uh, oh, dried fish. fish. Yeah, dried fish. Cats with rum, guava, and rum. No crossing. Oh! When you go to a person's house here in, in Benin, first thing they'll do is they'll give you water. But first, they will take a drink. I'm a to show you that it's good, it's not bad, it won't harm you. And then after they take a drink, you can take a drink. Because we are all brothers and sisters and we share the same thing, it's symbolic. So, a drink for me, a drink for you, and a drink for the ancestors. Benin, you owe me nothing. <laughs>